pressure looks good. All right, folks, let's see if this is working. I'm John Galloway with NASA Spaceflight. You know how every one of these live streams start. Tell me if you can see and hear me. Do I look like my, 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 my Max Headroom, or can you actually hear what I'm saying? I have a headset on today. I usually don't wear a headset. A little bit weird for me, but uh, I'll read some chat. Aces says that I'm 5x5. Five five. Let's. Ow. It looks like it hurt. I like cut my finger off. You gotta watch the green screen there. Um, Max Headroom. Max, I can't do a good Max Headroom. We hear you. Perfect visual contact. Five by five. Hey, folks. Welcome to another episode of NSF Live. Like I said, I'm John Galloway with NASA Spaceflight. Working a couple technical issues at the beginning of the stream. It's like a rocket launch. I mean, what would it be if we didn't have a technical issue? We use a, a service that actually acts as a relay, and that service was down. So I had to reconfigure a bunch of our stuff here so that we could uh, pipe it straight to YouTube. Something we can always do. It just takes a little bit of extra time sometimes, as I was not very... <clears throat> happy with the relay service let's put it that way but we're here we're live i'm wearing the wrong hat whatever what are we gonna do we have another episode of nsf live today if i sort of scoot out of the way you can see that we're planning on doing one of those wacky nsf lives today where it's full-on q a you know sometimes we have different topics we talk about it there's like a list of things and we go through it and it's like no this person's gonna talk and now this person no well, we're not doing that today we're just gonna make up some stuff and we're gonna do some q a for y'all so get your questions ready since we are live remember that you can tag us at nasa space flight that'll make it appear in i mean there's a lot of monitors around me but that'll make it appear up on the screen um We'll answer as many of your questions as we can. We may not be able to get to everything, but let's hop over and introduce our other experts here today, our other hosts. I am not the expert. I'm just the guy who makes the little live stream lights blink in the proper order. But uh, here we go right now. I've got an animated shot on this side. Thomas Berghardt, how are you doing, buddy? I'm good, Doss. Recovering from last night's Delta Force scrub still, but uh, happy to hang out for some NSF Live today. All right, in chat, uh, let us know y'all are getting uh, are y'all getting Thomas's audio there correct? You know Thomas five by five. Just say that in chat if you can hear Thomas correctly. Also on the other side, you can see I've got a static shot here. That static shot, of course, uh, Jack Byer. You don't also often see pictures of Jack himself. In fact, he's he's sort of going incognito with his ninja mask, but Jack is dialing in as well. Jack, go ahead and hop in and let us know if we can hear you as well. Can you hear me? Check one, check two. All right, chat, y'all know the drill. Can you hear Jack okay? Jack is actually remote um, out on the side of the... How fresh is this selfie? Jack, how fresh <laughs> is like, this picture you sent me? Like minutes old. I, you had, I had to be cajoled into taking that too. I hate taking pictures of myself. <laughs> you look good. You look like you're sort of concerned about taking this picture. You'd rather be using the real camera behind you, which happens to be pointed at... What is that pointed at? Uh, grain silo. Grain silo. <laughs> Grain silo. So you're somewhere in the Midwest. Um, it's the heartland of America, corn country, and that is a big grain silo behind you. Thank you. Yeah, not doing anything <laughs> interesting, not looking at anything interesting right now, just hanging out, <laughs> looking at a grain silo. Looking at a grain silo. So I, again, y'all, we're making this up as we go. Um, like I said, we are live. Jack and Tom, Jack, Jack and Thomas are going to be helping me out today, uh, answering some questions and stuff like that. We do have a list of topics to talk about. Um, of course, you, you may have realized Jack is out at Boca Chica. He is out there uh, preparing for that hop. He's going to be assisting Mary and uh, hopefully getting some live stream views going. We don't know that we're going to get two different views going, but we are seeing what we can do with the gear that we have on hand. But uh, he's out there to, to participate and partake in that, I guess we could say. But for today, we're going to be talking about all sorts of different things. And I think we should start off with the traffic jam of rockets at the Cape, what is going on at the Cape? Thomas, tell us about your experiences out there. Right. So if you were awake at the wee hours this morning, uh, you know that we were live from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station down here in Florida. Um, we were hoping that early this morning we would see a Delta 
for Heavy Rocket launched the NROL 44 mission. Uh, myself and Chris Gebhardt and Julia Bergeron were all out at the keep uh, to cover the launch. Uh, the window opened at 2.04 Eastern time in the morning today. Uh, and that launch time never happened because of a, a couple different technical issues. I think the biggest one was a... Um, like a ground support equipment issue or something. Um, again, admittedly, I'm operating on a little sleep, so forgive me if I forget the details. But uh, yeah, the launch did not happen at the opening of the window. They pushed about an hour and 15 minutes into the window. Eventually, it was 328 Eastern they were trying to launch. And as you can see on your screen, they did light the engines. Uh, engine ignition did occur. Um, all three of the first stage cores on the Delta IV did ignite. But shortly after, they shut right back down and the rocket didn't move an inch. Um, turns out that uh, the onboard computers on Delta saw something they did not like. Uh, I believe Tori Bruno tweeted afterwards it was a ground equipment uh, trigger that caused the abort. Um, so they're looking into that. Um, because of the fact that those engines did light, um, it's actually going to be at least seven days uh, before the uh, re recycle attempt. And before I forget, Das is pointing out the giant flare stack. Uh, because Delta IV is a hydrogen-powered rocket, uh, excess fuel that needs to be vented does get its own flare stack. If you're familiar with Boca Chica when they were doing the methane flare stack, very similar concept. Um, and as you can see, as soon as they abort that uh, liftoff, the flare stack comes to life. And uh, as the system responds to a sudden lack of missing rocket and all that hydrogen has to be handled right away so uh yeah so they aborted right after ignition um they're going to be working for at least a week to get back to another launch attempt um because of this we initially believe that one of the two spacex falcon 9 launches on sunday was going to have to be postponed there are two launches scheduled for sunday sunday morning is a starlink mission the 12th starlink mission or the v1 l11 mission um, launching on a Falcon 9 from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, that launch will travel northeast like all the other Starlink missions. The first stage will land on a drone ship. Of course, I still love you. Um, and that launch is on track for Sunday morning at 10, 10 a.m., 10, 12 or something like that. Um, because sort of mid-morning on Sunday. Um, we And we didn't have any reason to believe that this would affect that. Um, Delta does have range priority because it's a national security mission, but um, because it's going to take at least a week to recycle again, it's not going to ask for the range on Sunday. The other launch on Sunday is the SALCOM 1B mission, which has been delayed many a times. It was first delayed because of COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and finally they kind of came back, and there was, uh, there was some other delays involved. Basically, we have eventually came up to around this time of year, and they're finally ready to go. Uh, this mission is the first launch into a polar orbit from Cape Canaveral uh, since 1969. Um, you will actually fly south from Cape Canaveral rather than east um, and perform a slight dogleg maneuver once it passes the bottom tip of Florida to reach its final orbital inclination, overfly Cuba uh, at a very high altitude, um, and enter a polar orbit that way. And this is part of SpaceX's ongoing efforts to the uh, clutter the West Coast manifest and help them launch more polar missions by utilizing both Vandenberg and Cape Canaveral for those polar launches. Um, so this is a very historic mission in that sense. It is also a return to launch site landing, which those of us who live here on the Space Coast are very excited about because we get to see a Falcon 9 landing. Um, the first stage will return to land at LZ-1, not a drone ship, because um, it's a very nice light payload. Falcon 9 has extra performance to do that. Um, so that's very exciting. The reason we thought that launch would probably get delayed is because of the southbound trajectory, it actually has to fly very close to the Delta IV launch pad, um, which means that should something go wrong in the very early stages of flight, there was a risk that falling debris from a potential explosion could damage the range assets just to the south of the pad, which currently includes a Delta IV Heavy carrying a very expensive and very valuable national security satellite. Um, it really isn't much to do with the Delta IV rocket itself. The same thing would happen if, let's say, an Atlas V was launching south over a Falcon 9 at Pad 40. Um, it's more about the payload. The NRO very specifically said, we do not want this launch to occur when our satellite is sitting right south of the pad. Did, did I get the that pad is what, right there, Thomas? Is that, yes, is, that, I got uh, yep, that is the Delta yeah. IV heavy pad right there. That's pad 37, or gotcha. launch complex so, 37. Uh, so, the pad that Delta on is 37B. So that's where the SpaceX rocket is launching from. Yep, and that because, is launch complex 40. Yeah, and, and because it's going to the south, you can actually see it almost overflies that pad. 
yes, right there. And you can and see the, uh, the danger zones that are marked for airspace and waterway closures and things like that uh, definitely encompass almost all of those launch pads. Um, so we, what we thought as soon as uh, we realized that this morning the Delta IV had scrubbed um, is that the Salcom 1B mission was going to have to wait until Delta launched, which is what we were originally told um, by, by, by range sources and things like that. However, this morning we were surprised at a couple of things. First of all, the Eastern Range released weather forecast for both launches on Sunday, um, which is weird because we thought that they were going to have to push the Salcom mission, um, but both Starlink and Salcom got updated weather forecasts. Um, and then just recently, SpaceX has confirmed that they are still targeting both launches on uh, Sunday. Um, so something has changed between yesterday and today uh, that... Oops. Did we just lose Thomas there, or do we lose somebody uh, else? They... Thomas, you still with go us? Go ahead. Yeah, okay. I'm here. We just uh -oh. got you. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You're good. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know what that was, but... Uh... But, all right, so did I? What did, where did I stop talking? Uh, you were talking about multiple launches. Right. Okay. So um, basically, the Salcom One B mission uh, is now being allowed to continue. Something has changed since the Delta Four scrubbed, and uh, the NRO has given SpaceX permission to launch their southbound mission uh, near the Delta Four pad. Um, so both of those launches are now on track for Sunday, and the the Salcom One B mission is just after 7 p.m. Uh, Sunday night local time. Um, so two very exciting Falcon 9 missions on Sunday, and the Cape Canaveral is still going to be pretty busy despite the uh, Delta Force scrub. Yeah, gotcha. All right, let me hop back over this way and see if this is working as well. Um, a lot of people are asking, what is it that we have up on the screen right now? This is actually called Flight Club. So if you don't know what Flight Club is, you're missing out. I'm going to put a link to this in chat here. But a Flight Club is a, is a website that our friend Declan makes that actually visualizes these trajectories. And I'll explain a little bit about it. Um, here is a link to it right there. And this was the SALCOM 1B launch that we're looking at. That's what that link is going to take you to. But you can see this is just a 3D interface. You can sort of zoom in and out of it. And it takes what we know about the launch. It puts in hazard zones and stuff like that, and you can actually see where it where the launch is supposed to go. You can you can visualize the trajectory of the launch. And why is this cool? A lot of people were asking, what's a dog leg, right? So the dog leg is whenever you sort of go in one direction and then change course, right? It's like running a football play, like go, go down 10 yards, dog leg, whatever, and then throw the pass. Sorry. Soccer, no, no, no. It's dog leg in American football. <laughs> I'm gonna get fired and or slapped for that, but uh <laughs> Anyways, the dog leg is is a maneuver that we can use whenever we need to miss some sort of target. If we don't want to go straight south because that would fly over, I don't know, Miami, inhabited areas, you can actually have the rocket start off by going out to sea a little bit and then start to turn in the trajectory that it wants to go to. And uh, the dog leg is a little bit inefficient. It allows you, or it takes a little bit more delta V that you need to actually expend in this direction to get that trajectory to turn a little bit, but it allows you to stay safe without flying over land. Now, you may look at this and say, well, DOS, it still flies over land. Like, look right here, right? What's the deal? That's far enough downrange that uh, they, they designate that, that it's okay to fly over land. You can see the two warning zones here, I guess, right? It, are both, both those warning zones are for this launch, right? Uh, yeah, so the one that you're seeing just to the west of the Bahamas there, uh, that your mouse was closer to, that is actually the drop zone for the first stage should the boost back burn fail. Ah. Uh, they actually keep that zone enclosed just in case the engines don't reignite for the boost back burn. So that's that one, and then the one slightly below that is where the fairings will drop, um, and where fairing recovery will actually be attempted by one of the SpaceX recovery vessels. Um, that was an interesting thing we were tracking when these two launches were getting ready because the SpaceX only has two fairing recovery vessels um, right. and you need one to catch each half of the fairing. Um, they fall, the two halves fall fairly close to one another, but not close enough that one ship can catch both of them. Um, so you need both. Uh, what SpaceX has chosen to do is send one ship to each a zone because there's a fairing recovery zone for Salcom and another for Starlink, which is very much to the northeast, very far away from one another. Um, so what we think they will do is they will try to catch one fairing half from each mission, and the ship will then go and 
pick up the other one which has splashed down in the water um, because they can still usually use those to some degree. Gotcha. Um, so that's what we think their plan is because otherwise if they send both ships to one location, sure they might be able to catch both of them, but they wouldn't be able to recover the paths from the other mission at all. Um, so they'd rather have two catches and two fish out recoveries versus or yeah versus two catches and no fish out recoveries so gotcha. um that was interesting yeah, a, to see too that's a normal thing they've done intentionally before right where they've said no we are not going to try the catch the ship is there but it's not going to try to catch it it'll just fish it out of the water so that's that's an intentional thing they've done right yes absolutely yeah. all right good deal so that's what's going on with Salcom. What else is all going on? We talked about the Delta IV. Uh, we know Delta IV with that NROL 44 satellite launch or, or whatever it is. Cannot confirm or deny whatever the <laughs> NROL launch is. It could be a basket of fruit for all we know. Uh, <laughs> it's a true statement. I don't know why we would pay for that, but whatever. Um, <laughs> NROL 44 is at least seven days because the R68As on the rocket lit up and it takes a while to recycle those. Uh, we thought that that was going to push back Salcom, but for some reason, Salcom is still marching forwards, and that is supposed to be tomorrow morning, correct? Uh, Salcom is tomorrow evening, Starlink is tomorrow morning. Thank you. So yeah. that's the one that I missed. There's a Starlink launch that's supposed to be going out tomorrow morning, and then Salcom still ongoing tomorrow evening for some reason. Um, somebody's made a decision that that one, even though there's some sort of flyover here, they're still going to go ahead for that. Right now is our information, right? Yeah, and that and that is almost certainly an NRO decision. Um, they, I mean, it's very possible they looked at, you know, all right, Delta Force is going to be sitting here for a week. It, uh, they don't want to keep SpaceX waiting for and waiting for this mission to go, so they probably reevaluated and found some way to say, you know what, it's okay for them to launch. Right, um, but is that would be an that NRO is, decision. That really is one of the challenges of the multi-user spaceport. Like, look at Cape yes. Canaveral here. When you look at Cape Canaveral, you've got 39A, which SpaceX launches out of. You've got 39B, which I'm not going to jinx it and say what may ever launch out of there. You got the, <laughs> you've got 41, which is uh, United Launch Alliance, right? You've yep, got Atlas 40. V and Vulcan. Yep, Atlas V and Vulcan. You got 40, which is SpaceX launching Falcon 9s. You've got 37, which is Delta IV Heavy. You've got uh, Northrop. Uh, no, no, no. You've got uh, Blue Origin that's working on a big yeah, facility. Which, and uh, I can't pull that one out on a map yet, but it's, it's way south. Yeah, it's somewhere down here. I think it's. It's like one. Of, I think it's one of the line. last ones. I'll just draw a bigger circle and hope that I got it. <laughs> circle um, the whole screen. It's in there somewhere. <laughs> you have Blue Origin somewhere in this area. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's in there somewhere. But but you get to the point where these rockets are launching so frequently, you don't want the entire operation to shut down all the users at the spaceport to stop because of one scrub. And so Absolutely. definitely something I think we're going to see more and more as we go as we as we really go into more and more of these rockets flying out of the Cape or out of other multi-user spaceports, right? Um, and yeah, we did talk about a bit on the stream last night, but um, all of the launch providers, ULA and SpaceX, um, have all agreed that. With the reintroduction of this polar launch corridor, um, they will not stop one another from launching polar missions just because they overfly another pad. So if there's a launch from 39A, which will now basically overfly all of the other active launch pads, um, ULA will never stop that on their own uh, from, from SpaceX conducting a mission like that. Uh, same thing goes for an Atlas V launch, which would overfly SpaceX's pad at 40. Um, SpaceX is not allowed to stop a ULA launch because of that. Um, so the reason it's up applicable to Salcom, or at least was prior to whatever changed, um, is a payload customer uh, thing, the NRO. And no one is about to tell the NRO what to do, so they get for, they get to do whatever they want. <laughs> they're, they're sort yeah, of Thomas, a... you, you, you thank the NRO for your uh, camera sensors, and you like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, I, I, I'm going to point out one more time. And Jack, I know you're out there, like, hop in any time um, when you have comments and stuff. I'm going to point out something on the screen. A lot of people don't understand this, but again... 39B, 39A, 41, 40, 37. And then look at all these right here. There's, yep. sorry, the green, the red pin is a little bit harder to see, but those are also all old launch pads. In fact, and you one can see of them, the uh, landing complexes there too. Yep. yep. That is LZ1 right now. You see the trajectory comes back down to there. And then you know Blue Origin's doing some stuff down here. So Cape Canaveral has a really long history and there's a lot of infrastructure out there. It's not just one or two pads that's launching things. So I I love to see so many different rockets flying from the Cape. I love to see so many different rockets flying in general. So what else uh, were we going to talk about? Yeah, well, there's questions. a whole 
there's a whole other slate of other things coming up this weekend um, that we might want to touch on because there's even more things happening Sunday that are not at Cape Canaveral, and I think uh, Jack is pretty familiar with at least one of those events. What yeah, are, so what... far we have we have road closures up for Sunday still, right? That hasn't changed in the time I've been out here. <laughs> uh, nope, that's still on for Sunday as far as I'm concerned. Yay! Yeah, I'm really excited uh, to see one of these things fly. Starhopper was one thing, but I think that was basically like minimally fueled and minimally throttled. Um, so I'm I'm very excited to see a, a more uh, full size vehicle. I mean, just looking at it right now, someone standing next to it, it's it's so huge. Yeah, <laughs> I can't believe it can fly. And then driving in, driving in past the build site, like. I don't know. It's just surreal to see SN5 at the build site. And then at the same time, in your same field of vision, you can look down the road at the launch site, and there's SN6. I mean, it's bonkers how how fast they're going here. Let me do this really quickly uh, before we switch over to the topics. I'm going to see if we can get a link, because I know there was an anniversary coming up. But uh, let me grab some Super Chaps. Dan Vitale, thank you so much. Just wanted to donate to tomorrow's snack budget. To the snack budget, nice. For the Launch Hop Fest Sunday. Uh, Future Martian, also with another $20 there. Future Martian, thank you so much for the support, too. We appreciate you. You're always showing up, tossing a little bit into the pot. And uh, thank you so much. And we've also got Vince Quarter Quartararo. Quartararo? I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but Vince, a new membership. We appreciate you joining the red team here. Thank you for supporting the stream. I'm going to see if I can't get a link to that uh, that Hopiversary. I think we had a video from Jack down there. And then yep. Jack, we can talk about that video while you talk about what's going on. And somebody in the oh, control Oh, yeah, that was a couple days ago. There. Yeah, it was a couple days ago, wasn't it? 27. That yeah. was awesome, man. I mean, I'm glad I could be here for that just because obviously nothing was happening, but um it was just neat it was neat to hang out with hopper and actually while i was just sitting here on the side of the road shooting some time lapses that day uh two water trucks came up and, <laughs> and did a water delivery i don't know if, if the water actually goes into star hopper or not but um there's a bunch of black tanks next to it now that are we do know are water tanks so two water deliveries into star hopper so star hopper got to hang out with it on its anniversary while it had uh I don't know, and see its new life as a camera, camera platform, tripod, radar, flash, potential water tower. Who knows? It's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's nuts what's happened in just a year. If they really do turn Starhopper into a water tower, does that mean they're eventually going to turn the early starships to grain silos? Because I think that's the logical continuation of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why not? Just repurpose them? And it, but you joke, but honestly, if they ended up using... Um, Future, and I've said this before, if they end up using future starships or like SN5 and 6, if they don't perplode at some point, they end up using them for whatever purposes, whether it's, I mean, I don't know that they could use them for cryogenic fluid storage, like as part of the tank farm. I don't know. They're going to need a whole bunch more tank farm space, whether that's water, whether that's cryogenic fluids. And I mean, SN2, they've been modifying that over in the corner for however long. It wouldn't shock me completely if they ended up using some of this stuff over again, but it would be pretty hilarious. So, Jack, I got a your remembering Starhopper video up on the screen right now. Um, this is yours, right? Yeah, it's NASA Space Flight. I think this is your video, isn't it? Yeah, I shot some of it, and Mary shot most of it. Got, oh, gotcha, <laughs> I, gotcha. As you, as you would expect, uh, Mary shot most of it, and then some of those are my shots from when I was here for the static and the and the twenty meter hop and the one fifty meter hop. So. It's a mix of both of our footage. Gotcha. Um, yeah, pretty nifty. Um, and there's some like RCS tests in there that I shot from the dunes. Um, there's and like there was one RCS test in there I think from like the side of the road. <laughs> Scared the heck out of me. I was really <laughs> stand, standing next to it. So yeah, it's a really nice video. And and also it's just like at this point, I mean, I'm getting uh, stop me for, for when I get too nostalgic here. But no. sitting here, sitting here, looking at how much things have changed in the last year, and even since February when I was here last, uh, I mean, it's rapid. And I know I always say, "Oh, they're going so fast," but no, it's crazy. And looking back at that video now, it's just like it's com it's a completely different world. It's already changed 100 percent, or you know, dramatically from from that. So it's a nice little historical artifact and. That's the kind of thing that, we, you know, why we say thanks, Mary, and whatnot so much, and why it's important that so many photographers and whatnot out here, you know, document what's going on, because it's changing so fast. Yep. Yep, absolutely. I'm just going to let this video keep rolling while we yeah. while we talk about it. Uh, it's just, speaking oh, yeah. of... I see, 
Go ahead. I can't see it just for the I, I so I can't see what you're doing right now. I'm just ah, done voice only. Gotcha, gotcha. But yeah, I mean, you can tell me what part of it you were at. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, no. Right I, now we're I, at RCS thrusters. We're at the RCS test. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, those were insanely loud uh, from the side. I mean, I was. It's the kind of thing where you're like, oh, should I start getting away? <laughs> no, no, everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just my panicky nature, but yeah. Yeah, we got a sort of a panning shot right now of the the little alien guy painted on the side of it, like for yeah. scale. Oh, nice. That was like the, the kind of silly, you know. It's one of those things where they did it, and you were like, "Really, guys?" <laughs> it yep. kind of looks derpy, but it looked cool. I mean, it, it, it definitely gave you a sense of scale. I'm... They uh they did have a like a, a mannequin of a cowboy on the early grass the Falcon Nine grasshopper looking test vehicles. Oh, they had hilarious. like that that cowboy like strapped to the side of it. Um, so yeah, I guess it's a thing with SpaceX. We, we humans for scale on their hop test vehicles. <laughs> I mean, it's it is really useful. Like even just sitting across the road from one of these vehicles and looking at it. I know I keep harping on that, but it's 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 the reference point that I have right now. Uh, it, even across the road, it's easy for scale to get distorted, and then you see a ultra lift or a boom lift come up next to it, or you see somebody walking around on the launch mount or platform or whatever. And then you get a direct one-to-one, -one, you know, comparison next to a human, and that really, really puts it into perspective. Because yep. it's easy; it's easy to think, you know, oh, that doesn't look that big. Humans are notoriously bad at judging things like scale and volume and and whatnot. And no, it's a massive, what, sixty-foot tall cylinder of of steel. It is not to be trifled with. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna circle really quickly here. This again, this is Hopper. It's amazing how sort of empty the scene looks because i'm used to the texas tank watchers sort of skyline and there's oh, there's yeah. almost nothing here in this shot there's a couple tanks and hopper itself but you were just talking about the scale jack look at the uh truck there so does everybody see the truck and the trailer that's in the middle and then that gives you a sense of the scale that's a full-size pickup truck right there it's a crew cab it's got four doors on it it's got that's probably a short bed, honestly, but like a 6.5 foot bed. It's got the big tr trailer behind it, but look at the scale of Starhopper compared to that truck. And this is Starhopper. The things that are flying now are even larger than this. Yeah, it's <sighs> crazy. Starhopper, it, Starhopper alone is huge. I mean, <laughs> huge and hilarious. Yeah. I think we can all we can all agree. <laughs> um, and as they as they start getting into more and more rocket like rockets. Uh, or you know rockets that look like rockets it's just it's gonna be nuts and i'm i'm excited for when they we get aero surfaces on one of these things but starhopper and starhopper had a great a great uh, career i'm so happy that it's still you know at on the site and active and it didn't get scrapped it makes me really really happy i We're like when i like when flamethrower right the, now uh, jack <laughs> oh my gosh so so yeah starhopper's what like um 20 meters high, so 60, Starhopper's 60 feet high, something like that. So it's a 60 foot flame, you know, because it's about the size of, of Starhopper itself. It's a huge, <laughs> huge flame. I would just like to <laughs> underscore how huge that flame is. <laughs> oh, geez. So this and you was... can hear it too. You can hear it from, the, from where we were. It was just like a big, you know, exactly as you would expect, almost like a hot air balloon furnace kind of sound, just like a bah. <laughs> So this was this was a year ago on the 27th. So two days ago, it's like a year and two days ago, right? 27th? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. That was the 150 meter hop. What a day. Oh, this is, this video is labeled the six month anniversary. It was the six month anniversary on February 27th, and now yeah. here at, on August 27th, it was one year. Gotcha. Yeah, I was in, I was impatient with the anniversary video. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. When when my daughter was born, I got her a six month birthday cake, so I'll I'll allow it. Nice. It's fine. Yeah, it's oh, that's adorable. Very very half happy half birthday to you. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so so Starhopper has now been sort of I'm not gonna say relegated. It has been retired. It gets to rock on the porch and just be a water tower for real now, while the other larger uh, younger rockets, I guess we could say. Uh, continue yeah. on like the one that's hopping tomorrow or the one that's hopping tomorrow the one that's hopping soon i think it's we're I mean, if the you, schedule if it you should think, be tomorrow well, first, first off i want to talk about old rockets because you got me thinking now. sure <laughs> forget your actual information um no it is kind of like a, it's like a grandpa rocket right or like a, like a like an elder rocket because most rockets they they launch and then they die or they go into the ocean or whatever and yep so the uh, the life of a rocket is really really short so for a rocket to exist after a single launch even it's like now 
it gets into like immortal territory. It's like practically, <laughs> practically can never die. Yeah. God, that's just it. Even it even looks sort of wrinkly and stuff like that. I mean, the build, I mean, the build quality. I don't even know if that's the right way to say it. Uh, but there's the hop on the screen right now. The original build for this with the big beefy legs and the wrinkly sort of tanks and stuff like that. And now all these sleek, new, shiny stainless steel things, they just get, they get, they look like they get younger and younger the more of these things that they build, don't they? Darn kids, get off my launch mount. <laughs> get off, get off. Back in my day, I had to hop up the hill both ways <laughs> in the snow. I don't know how that works, but it's Texas. There's not a lot of snow down there. <laughs> I like it. Oh, shaking, wow. shaking its landing leg at them. Like, <laughs> get off my launch mount. <laughs> Can I just say, and I feel like I say this every time we look at one of the Star Hopper or Starship videos, but because of all the dust down there in Boca Chica, the only thing I can see when these hop tests happen, or even the static fires, the big cloud of dust is just looks like you're launching or landing on Mars. Like, that's just what it looks like. It looks like that scene from The Martian, the launch scene. It's exactly the same. Yeah. yeah, I never even thought of that, but you're right. It's it's it adds to the surreal nature of yeah. the spectacle. Yep, absolutely. And so it's it's got we've got the end of the hop video there, Jack. Uh, you see the venting at the end of the hop, some stills as well from the hop. But I want to point out one other thing because I know Mary was out there taking some fantastic photos the other night. Let me see if I can grab those really quickly. Oh, <laughs> the hopper under the stars thing. Nobody needs to see the end screen. <laughs> but this is from just a couple of days ago. Yeah, this is from the 27th as well. Oh, these were so awesome. Yeah. Look at this shot, y'all. Hopper with the uh, people sitting underneath it. I'm going to have to actually change this just a bit. Yeah, let you me... have to scroll down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, let me open it in a new tab so I can zoom out some. There, you there go. we go. So so this is a photo that Mary Mary took. That's SN6 back there in the background, right? And then yep. Hopper up here. And look at the people sitting on the picnic tables. I want to have lunch under Starhopper so yeah. badly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's such a cool shot. It's seriously awesome. And I mean that that view um probably won't last much longer. So it's a yep. it's it's a very awesome I hate to say it again, historical shot. It's a yeah. I love it. I really do love that shot in particular. Yeah. It's just it, and what was that was that Lar or one of one of us uh called it the Nighthawk, you know, called it like it was similar to Nighthawks, the, the Edward Hopper painting, which of course yeah. is hilarious because it's Hopper. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, there you I go. couldn't agree more. It's like a very, very much like a modern uh, a modern Nighthawks or like a, almost like a sci-fi Nighthawks. I, I really love that photo. Yeah. Even just the colors in the shot, Mary took such a, such a good picture there of the workers just sort of resting and you have the floodlights, the sort of orange in the background. That right there looks like Mars. It does, yeah. That orange looks like Mars. They need to be wearing spacesuits or masks or something <laughs> like that. But that looks like Mars in the background. Or this is terraformed Mars and they're just in one of the parts that's still, you know, Mars red, but uh, still, they still don't need spacesuits anymore. Yeah. <laughs> that's, why they're, that's why they're construction workers. They're on the terraforming crew. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> And Hopper is actually a big terraforming tower. It carries equipment that they use to warm It's a water Mars. tower. You need water in the atmosphere to terraform. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> All right, everybody, get your tinfoil hat out. We yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, really quickly, I'm going to hit a couple more Super Chats here again. Yeah. Thanks for joining us at NSF Live. We are making it up as we go today. We don't have a big schedule. We're reminiscing about Hopper. Jack is there. We've got a static picture of Jack. He's out at uh, Boca Chica preparing for the hop uh mary is out there as well of course we're not going anywhere without mary and we will be standing by for that hop the next couple of days hopefully that goes tomorrow but a couple of super chats from of course south padre how are you doing hey Mark says sunblock sunblock for jack tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> oh they don't they don't know yet south padre uh-oh yeah right <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, I've been making I've been making some plans. We'll see what I, where I end up tomorrow. Nice, making some plans. So South Padre, thank you so much for the ten dollars, Jack. Put ten dollars worth of sunblock on. Honestly, <laughs> Jack, dude, you're out in Mojave and stuff like that. I think I think you know how to deal with the sun, don't you? <laughs> yeah. I honestly, it's a it's a uh, what do you call it? Like a dirty confession or whatever. Like yeah. I don't put I don't ever put sunscreen on. Like really? almost never. <laughs> uh, it's probably terrible that I don't, but. Uh, <laughs> I also don't really burn uh, easily, thankfully, because yep. I have uh, Middle Eastern genes in me. So I just get darker. It's amazing. I often don't burn, and I hopefully will never get skin cancer, but knock on wood, we'll see what happens. 
Well, I was going to point out Dayong. in your selfie. In your selfie, you have like one of those hats with the back, right, like the, the yeah. shade on the back. Yep. So <laughs> you, uh, you've got a light colored shirt on. You've got that tan hat that sort of covers your neck because your neck is one of the worst things out there. You don't think about yeah, it for me. You, yep. For me, it's neck, nose, and ears because I have a big honk and schnoz, and I've got giant ears. So it's like whatever sticks out past the slipstream of your of your shadow or whatever. You know what I mean? Like it's it it gets brutal real quick. So yeah, sometimes you gotta do some sunscreen. Thank you, South Padre, for the this, for the ten bucks uh, super chat. And we'll oh, I gotta text you in a little bit here when we're uh, when I'm not live. Nice. Wow. Wow. A lot of times, uh, like when I go out, I'll get the raccoon effect, right? So you're wearing sunglasses or something like that. Yeah. And you end up with a tan everywhere except for your sunglasses. Yep. And I, I think yep, it may yep. be different this year because you're going to have the mask tan line where you don't get a lot of sun <laughs> on a mask and then the rest of your face is sunburned. <laughs> I like I'm st- I stupidly swap which wrist my watch is on so that I don't get the watch band ba- like tan. Yeah. And I, even then I don't swap it enough and so one one arm will be slightly like more pale in that area and the other arm will be a little bit less pale but still pale in that area and it's like okay I'm just not winning I should just give up. You you look <laughs> like you did some time you got handcuffed tan lines where it's on both wrists. Yes. Like something, something going on. Yeah. <laughs> People giving me eyes at the grocery store or something when I go for my wallet. <laughs> Let me keep on running some super chats here. Uh, Aces down for some more cold drinks for Jack and Mary tomorrow. Absolutely. Aces down. Thank you so much for some more cold drinks for Jack and Mary. Uh, We also got Jerwa. Here is one uh, for Jack to pick up one of those water spritzing fans. It's going to be a (laughs) hot one tomorrow. So Jerwa, thank you so much for that one. We've got a new member, Kat Turnus. Thank you so much for the new membership. We appreciate you there. Uh, Dougal as well. This is Canadian699. Thanks for everything everyone at NSF does for the Rocket community. The live streams are the highlights of my weeks. Much appreciated. Dougal, we appreciate you too. Thank you so much for the uh, 699 Canadian and, and everything that you do, being a part of the community, showing up, watching, et cetera, et cetera. Ferenc. Ferenc Pashier, I'm going to go with. Ferenc, it's Ferenc. Come on, Ferenc. Now. we know Ferenc here. Ferenc, Ferenc Pashier, 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 I think. Pashier, there you go. Um, thank you so much as well for the Hopper Rocks there. That was 549 euros. We've also got Sam Halter. Thanks, Jack and Chris, for the loss of sleep and great commentary last night. Um, Thomas and Chris, I think, right? Yeah, me and Chris. Jack was already down to, gone his way down to Boca Chica yesterday, but uh, yeah. All right. Well, we appreciate you there, Sam Halter, as well. And then last but not least, Jeff Wildermuth. Jeff, when SpaceX builds the wall, is Mary going to fly a drone for pictures? Jeff, I can answer that one, no. It is illegal to fly a drone there. It's actually illegal to photograph that facility um, using a drone based on Texas laws. Texas has some very strict uh, drone flight and photography laws. So fence or no fence, there's not an option to photograph that from a drone i can answer that one and jack yeah, my, you looked into that didn't you yeah my under, not like flying a drone at the launch site or anything but just flying a drone in texas because i am a commercial drone operator and i was driving here from los angeles so naturally if there's something cool that i want to take any video of i want to abide by all the rules yep so i checked i checked you know in case i want to fly my drone at marfa texas or something weird like that uh um marfa you know, right i gotta go to marfa I yeah you gotta go to marfa any any <laughs> ufo fans in the chat oh man i don't mean i'm obviously not like oh aliens are among us or anything like that but uh but I, yeah i just want to go to marfa and just look at it and be like yeah this is that crazy place people go and think there's aliens um but i digress i digress uh, i looked into it and yeah the from my understanding is that you cannot photograph private property from a drone in texas unless you have the private property owner's consent. And the only carve-outs for that, there's a couple different carve-outs. I think it's mostly law enforcement. There's like a carve-out for a real estate agent, um, stuff like that. So, but, but even, even as a journalist, um, there is no exemption to that rule for journalism. So unless you have the, pri- the, the private property owner's consent, it's a no-go. So that's just not a thing we would do for multiple reasons down here in Boca Chica, that being one of them also, but also just, there's just drone flights are prohibited. There's signs all up and down the side of the road. No drones, drones prohibited, et cetera, et cetera. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Jack. And uh, lastly, uh, Piotr 
10 PLN, the last super chat in the queue there. And that would make us all caught up on super chat. So again, y'all, thank you so much for the support, the memberships and stuff like that, like space and racer with the new membership. Just as I said, I was all cut up. Welcome <laughs> to Patter at space and racer. We appreciate the support. So we're able to keep, there, there are two things that let us keep doing this. Um, an, an unending devotion to covering space flight activities <laughs> and surprise. It's, there are three things that anyways, <laughs> um, did anybody get the reference there? Thank you. <laughs> well, just go out and start over again. Um, there, there's a couple of things that allow us to keep doing this. One is the fact that we all work as a team. Jack's editing videos. Mary's recording videos. I'm doing live stream. Thomas is doing commentary and bringing up links and writing articles. And it, it, everything here behind the scenes, Michael's working on overlays. All this stuff works because of the team that's behind it. Trust me, I've tried to do this sort of stuff just myself. And I love working with NASA Spaceflight because it's such a team effort. You really can accomplish a lot more with the teamwork. And the second thing that allows us to do this is y'all. You show up, you retweet things, you click the little thumbs up likey button or whatever, the financial support, memberships, you watch ads on the daily videos, whatever it is. Um, we're able to do this because of y'all support. So I'm not going to harp on it. I'm not going to be like, oh, let's spend 30 minutes talking about whatever. Um, but we appreciate you. the NASA Spaceflight team would be possible without the team appreciates y'all being part of the community and supporting us so we can keep on doing this so from us to you thank you so much for all those super chats um oh it, there was a launch director that just came through oh wow Jay thank Esselfar. you so much yeah welcome to launch director there esselfar you're uh, not playing around there thank you very much for supporting our endeavors to bring all this cool community space light coverage to you so we really do appreciate you um I'm just rolling. This is one of the latest daily videos. Again, yeah. who edited this one? This one is SN8 probably stack Nick. orbital pad progress. Is this one of the other editors? Yeah, I think that's probably Nick. Yeah, there we go. Nick oh, yep. right there. So Jack on the road, we are uh, we did bring in some other editors to help out with this because there's no way that Jack can spend 10 hours a day editing videos and also make it down there and also do his other things and have any sort of life. So you may start to see some new names show up on these videos, Nick being one of them. Um, Brady's out there as well. You know, you've seen videos edited by Brady, but it's one more thing. It's a team that does it. We can't have one person who just drop everything you're doing and edit the video every single day. We, we work as a team for this stuff. So I'm going to roll the video in the background here. And you know what we haven't done? We, we need to get through some questions, I yeah, think. Yeah, exactly. Um, so y'all want me to just speed run some questions? Let's do it. All right. Yeah. So we'll start with this one. Elsfar just uh, joined as launch director, and it's also the first question in the queue. Do we know roughly what time the SN Hop 6 is planned tomorrow? So what's our window looking like for SN6 Hop if that occurs? I'm going to check right now because I don't want to like mess it up. The road closure... time oh and you brought it up anyway thank you Dos. i did i brought it up um, on screen but you were muted but now you're not so oh <laughs> uh yes 8 a.m to 8 p.m local time so 9 a.m to 9 p.m eastern time uh 1200 to 24 or 0 hundred, i guess uh utc um uh is the window for testing in boca chica tomorrow and they also have backup dates on monday and tuesday um but just, uh, so it could happen anytime in that window conversion in your head <laughs> yeah fly. for me it's it, utc is eastern plus four it's it's i've got that ingrained in my brain now so <laughs> yeah i'm still not there apparently you, you just out, you just out rocket nerded me well listen oh, if no. you write enough launch articles you just have to know it at some point so yeah <laughs> y'all thomas thomas jack it. i got called out by the boss uh, uh oh nasa space flight in chat chris b says and don't forget chris b on bandy cam where's the love <laughs> <laughs> I missed, I missed Chris B on Bandicam, the original video editing software. I don't even think I can call it video editing software. Yeah, I don't... <laughs> the, the original field expedient solution for cobbling together videos in a way that worked is the word that I'll use. <laughs> um, Bandicam, cobbling, Let's... cobbling together is the best word. <laughs> Put it. Put your hands together for Bandicam and the uh, Bandicam ninja skills of Chris And Chris B, Chris who was B. doing those. That is the managing editor for NASA Space Flight, Chris Bergen, was literally piecing together the first videos with Bandicam. And <laughs> when, like, some of our team members realized that's what was happening, they are like, okay, we need to fix this. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and that's basically why I jumped in. Also, uh, I mean, it's like, it's like his nickname is, I'm not an editor. <laughs> like, Chris, I'm not an editor, Bergen. 
And I'm like, Chris, I'll teach you how to use Premiere. If you want to know how to use Premiere, I'll, I'll happily learn you. I'll shoot a whole video. He doesn't want to know. Whole... Yeah, he's just like, I don't He wants to know part of it. Because <laughs> then he's on the hook to edit videos. He's like, no, right. no, no Bandy Cave anymore. I do he's not got enough know stuff on his plate. Premier, I think. So. <laughs> Uh, so the stories of early NSF YouTube production are incredible. <laughs> yeah, and I've I've pledged that we we will not allow Bandicam uh, to to touch our footage anymore. As as our post production supervisor, I refuse to allow it to happen. <laughs> videos videos that have touched Bandicam shall not touch our channel. Any pro prohibition reference there? Anyways, that's fine. Um, I'm old. I mean, I'm not as old as Prohibition, but I'm old. Um... <laughs> Thank you for that clarification, Tom. Yeah. Let me get some more questions here. Uh, so we have that window, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Central Standard or Central Daylight Time. We're on, still on Daylight yeah. Time tomorrow. Um, yep. Let me bring this up really quickly on the screen, the launch site perimeter wall. Jack, yeah. what's going on with the launch site perimeter wall out there? Have you Have you looked at that thing personally? I mean, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, I hate it. But what it is, is it? What it is? It's like it's like it looks like a combined storage, maybe even office space and a wall. Like it's containers on a concrete footing, if that's even the right word, on a concrete pad, and it's replacing the chain link fence. And it's quite tall. Um, but you know, it is what it is. I've been saying for a long time that this is it's going to change out here. It's going to go from being the wild west into being more like a real launch site, and I think this is kind of part of that. So eh, yeah. it is what it is. I mean, those are literally shipping containers that have been lined up and painted white on one side, correct? Yeah, and they they do that a lot. I mean, if you remember the tents over at the build site, they're kind of lined with those shipping containers too, or at least they used to be. I'm not sure if they still are, but. Uh, yeah, shipping, you know, it's expedient construction, like a lot of things here in Boca Chica. It's good yeah. done. Uh, you know, what's the what's the engineering triangle? It's like fast, cheap, and... Good. Pick and, two. And Yeah, and good. <laughs> and so you pick two. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, it, it looks like it's good enough. I mean, I understand the fence. That fence, is that is that like a chain link fence, or is that a fence you can't see through? The taller one that has all the, the stakes in a line, not the shipping containers. Uh, stakes in a line. Is, is that just like a solid fence, the darker colored fence? The the black color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like a like a wooden wall or a metal wall or I'm not sure what it is if it's even fabric or something. But it's yeah, you can't see through it. You can't see through it. And then you have the shipping containers that are lined up behind it. If I had to guess, those shipping containers almost look like uh, some sort of physical wall to stop FOD from hitting the road or something like that. If I had to guess, you think that's a good guess? Yeah, and honestly, it could be it could be a FOD wall more than a perimeter or a privacy wall. You know, who knows why they're doing it? I don't think. <laughs> I don't think their uh, their operations being seen are too much of a concern, given that they right. do everything out in the open out here next to a public road, next to a public beach. Um, but yeah, so it could totally be a FOD thing. I yeah. would like to pick the brain of, of whoever's putting it up and and uh, and ask what the deal is. But one way or another, um, there's still a bunch of awesome views of this launch site. It doesn't we don't necessarily need to 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 have unobstructed views from all angles all the time to get cool photos still and one thing you just optimistically at least for the near term um having driven around here and shot some photos since the last time i was here and since the wall has been up the angles that i liked are not covered by the wall really <laughs> the angles that i liked and shot from are not the wall does not affect the wall affects an area that i would normally probably not be shooting in that way or in that direction anyways so for now it's it's not really a factor, thank goodness. But you know, it, it certainly will grow to be over time. I Jack, I've paused the video where there's sort of a shot. The shipping containers are on one side, the leg of hopper is on the other side, and then you can see SN6 between them. Um, yep. Does it look like there is room between hopper and the road to fit these shipping containers, or do they look like they're going to stop once they get to hopper? Well, that's what I think. That's what Mary was saying to me the other day. Is that um, there are no, there isn't a concrete pad right there for gotcha. the ship for the next for the next shipping container to go down. So I don't know if they're just they just haven't poured one there yet, and there will be there will be a shipping container there eventually or not. Um, but yeah, it's right now it it's like the last fleeting moments of that that angle being open probably. Um, but you know who who knows? Maybe that would stay open right there, and and they 
leaf hopper kind of exposed to the road a little bit more like a monument than a walled off thing yeah it's yeah. so cool to be able to see under hopper and see the little the eating area the picnic I mean, tables yeah it's just it's so cool yeah so I ho hopefully that view doesn't go away but if it does so be it yeah it is what it is um i got the number for united rentals and we'll just rent a one of those man lifts that we see yeah there you go <laughs> mary can just get on top and drive down the road above the fence like <laughs> Maybe we could get one of those. We we know a guy in the UK. We could get one of those double decker buses, those red British buses. There you go. And then Jack, you could be down there driving, it, and Mary could be on the upper deck uh, filming stuff. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah, deal. Yeah, the NSF like, well, double decker it. bus. It was only a matter of time. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> um, I'm gonna get some more questions here. And yeah. Here is a big topic of conversation. Um, this is from Ole. I'm gonna go with Ole. Elon prompt, promised us a potential super heavy hop this year. What do you guys think about that? All right. So the context of this is that someone was asking Elon about uh, a couple of the update presentations that are coming up. Uh, I know Neuralink had something yesterday. Um, there's a Tesla update presentation coming up. And then he was saying they wanted to have a SpaceX Starship update um, by October. Um, and he said in that same tweet that he's hoping to have the first prototype booster hop by then, referring to the Super Heavy booster. Um, that's very optimistic. Most of us, I mean, we haven't seen confirmed signs of the construction of the first Super Heavy booster yet. Um, it's certainly possible that the hardware is down there. I mean, they're manufacturing steel rings like nobody's business. Um, so it's possible that Super Heavy, super heavy hardware exists already. Um, maybe even the Raptor engines that they want to use already exist. But um, we haven't seen that actually start construction in Boca Chica yet. Um, that said, yeah, if, if they see, start, yeah. If we see like a weird looking thrust puck get delivered in the next mm -hmm. couple of days or weeks, um, I bet you, you know, everyone will, will that would overanalyze be a sign, yeah. that, that thrust puck. And that'll be a huge tell because uh, I think it'll need to be slightly different um, yeah. to, to accommodate whatever they're going to do for super heavy. Yeah, oh, and Jack. what you're looking at right now yeah. is yeah, yeah. that super heavy high bay being constructed. In the um, abort. The, this is the abort, Thomas. Yeah, I believe so. They were trying to bring up that one piece, then it got spinning. I don't know exactly what happened, but I do yeah, know it's... that they were trying to... Uh, it, they're working on basically constructing that giant high bay where the blue crane is in front of, um, which is where they will construct the super heavy boosters. They need a nice tall structure to do that. And yeah, they were having some issues with this one part the other day. Yep. Yeah, they just got just got you know got some wind, took it, and it just started spinning. That was really cool footage from Mary that uh, that Nick put together. Because I mean, holy cow, <laughs> it's easy to look at it and think like, haha, that's silly. But no, think about it. Like, really think about it for a second. Yeah. That was a huge piece of very heavy metal, metal heavy enough that it necessitated the Manitowoc eighteen thousand to lift it, and it's just spinning like a pinwheel in the in the air. So. It is not a fun situation, and I'm glad uh, they got I'm that gonna, down safely. I'm going to point out something here real quick. Uh, this is sped up a little bit, but watch Bluezilla. You know that this structure here is fixed. This is the high bay that's already installed, deep in the ground, concrete footings. This is a really rigid structure that they're building. But watch Bluezilla against this structure, and you can see Bluezilla actually swaying, starting right? to sway. You don't yep. want that thing to start to sway especially if the wind gets this, there's a lot of momentum. That that piece of, of wall that they're picking up probably weighs a few tons. It's big steel girders and metal plates and stuff like that. And you get that momentum going. You don't want that to get out of control. You get sort of a resonant problem. So uh, exactly what I was going to say is I wonder yep. to what extent they could set up a resonance, you know, with the spinning and everything and just get, get that thing starting to shake itself apart. So that is you why, you know, it looks all like fun and games, like, haha, it's spinning around. But no, that's a serious situation. And you that's when you abort, put it back on the ground, and start from scratch. Yeah, right and in they here. And you know, you nothing came it. from it. You know, they did the right thing and kept everyone safe. But yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, you know that the operator of Bluezilla there, whoever's got their hands on the controls, it's not their first rodeo. You don't get straight out of yeah. crane school and hand <laughs> you this crane. You start with like a little crane that lifts like you know a little, a little pallet up or something. And then eventually, 30 years later, you're allowed to operate this thing. Um, the first, so they know the what first class at the first class at, at crane school is like when you sit on one of those little playground things yeah. with those <laughs> little shovelfuls of water, or, uh, shovel <laughs> two little sand. handles. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Like that's, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's crane school 101. You, <laughs> you, if you do okay in that, then you can move on to bigger stuff. <laughs>
this the, the operator of this has like multiple PhDs in crane operation and crane <laughs> theory. That's how you get to this crane. So let me get some more questions, y'all. Um, we were we were talking about super heavy. Do we think that super heavy is going to hop in October? Oh, no right. Less. Yeah. So sorry, we got sidetracked there. So yeah. We're, so the the point of that saying they want to do an update in October and they hope to have a hop by that October. Um, that's very optimistic because we haven't seen anything yet. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say that's not really attainable. Granted. It wouldn't be the first time that SpaceX has proved me wrong in something like that. Um, they tend to make hardware kind of appear out of nowhere, and all of a sudden they're right on track. Um, I think that is the optimistic timeline that Elon has set for that project. Um, I think it is more likely that we'll see it a few months later. It could be near the end of the year, maybe December time frame. I think that might be attainable. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure October is doable. This year, I wouldn't rule it out yet. What do you think, like, in the in the manufacturing flow? Yeah. Also, also to actually answer the question, I, I wouldn't rule it out. Also, but also, like you said, it's it'd be really hard to attain it, especially in the time frame that was given. Um, in the manufacturing flow, where do you reckon uh, um, the super the first super heavy prototype booster will fall? Because it does seem almost like it's lining up perfectly to end up being serial number ten. I don't know, you know, obviously they might even call it still number one super yeah, heavy. Yeah, I was going to say, like I don't that. know if super heavy and Starship will fall under the same lineage of serial numbers or if there will be super heavy SN1 or something like that. Yeah, but strictly just like in the in the manufacturing flow, it, it really seems to me like if they're trying to hit that date, eight is basically done and stacked in the mid bay. I bet you nine is pretty much already fully manufactured and just needs to be put together piece by piece. So then you know, the next thing up would be either what would be, you know, Starship 10 or Super Heavy 1, it, whatever I, whatever it ends up being. The thing in the 10th slot, I'm predicting would, to meet their their time frames and whatnot, would have to be the first Super Heavy prototype booster. So, yeah. so hopefully and we I'm start gonna... seeing parts of that soon. And I finally yeah. found the tweet here yeah, where I was gonna Elon say... said, yeah, go ahead, Thomas. I want, I want to talk about this because he says right underneath it uh, that the first Super Heavy hop will only need two engines. Um, so that's that removes a big schedule risk for like, oh, what if they need to have a whole set of uh, Raptor engines for the initial hop test, which I think is safe to say, especially because you're only hopping the booster, um, something like a 150 meter hop like they've been doing with the early Starship prototype, something like that. Um, perfectly reasonable. You only need two Raptor engines to do that um, because of the current super heavy engine configuration. You can use two engines. They will be symmetrical around the center of mass. You don't need to have a weird offset thrust problem or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it's like that's it's easier certainly, almost than, they than what have, they've already been doing. Yep, yep. Yeah, they certainly have the capability to have two Raptors ready to go. Um, they probably they could have two Raptors ready to go right now, honestly. Um, so I'm not really worried about that. It's simply a matter of stacking a big old super heavy booster. Um, and again. There's lots of commonality between Super Heavy and Starship. They're the same steel rings, it's just more of them, um, and there's no nose cone on top. Um, but uh, they need to finish the high bay to do that, um, and they need to stack the very first one. And I don't know, even if there's so much commonality, there might be subtle differences that they have to work around to make that first booster. Um, and it might end up being that they build the first booster, and they say, you know what, we learned some things when we were building the first one. We don't want to fly this one. We want to build another one that'll fly. Yep. Um, so the, all of that is kind of in the cards. Um, I, I do wonder. Am, yeah. Go for it. I was just saying, I'm very skeptical about October, which is what Elon says in the tweet. Um, this year, I would not rule out. Um, certainly by next year, I think we'll see the first booster testing. Yeah. I, I see a bunch of people in chat talking about, oh, how can it fly with only two? Well, you got to remember, super a super heavy booster hop versus a super heavy booster launch are two totally different things. Yeah. For the hop, you don't have a Starship on top. You don't have to have a full load of fuel. And remember, any rocket, the majority of mass on any rocket is its fuel. So if yep. you're allowed to just put like 10% of the fuel in, 5% of the fuel, and you just need to do a little hop, the mass of the rocket is way less. You don't need 31 Raptor engines. You can get it done with two. Yep. Um, so that's why they don't need all the engine complement. They can do a hop for a super heavy booster with a lot less. No Starship and not very much fuel in it at all. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if he tries to spool something up and gets it hopping, uh, gets a hop on the super heavy booster this year. We'll see. I, I wouldn't really, it really wouldn't shock me. And yeah. honestly, if you think about it too, as 
a lot of these, I mean, all the serial numbers so far of Starship are not full Starship prototypes. They're just sort of the tank section, right? Mm -hmm. So the super heavy booster is almost, I mean, I'm thinking in my head anyways, would almost be in a lot of ways, like not a full super heavy booster prototype in the same way and just be a tank section. And if it is just a super heavy booster tank section and not say like super structurally reinforced in areas that it would need to be to carry a starship on top of it, if it's just a tank section and a thrust puck, then it, it really is not a lot different than a, than a starship prototype. It's just bigger. Yep. Um, so hope, if that ends up being the case, then then yeah, they could totally seemingly anyways, put that together by the end of the year and get a hop into their belts. I mean, do not underestimate the steamroller because they are just being here is, is it's I'm in the reality distortion field right now. It's like, Oh, they're going so fast. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, look, you've edited hundreds of hours of this Boca Chica video and you've seen, I don't know how many hours of them building the high bay. I have to ask, we're looking at the video right now and I've got it paused where the workers are guiding that section into the top of the high bay. How do yep. they get up there? Do they ride a crane? Do they climb a ladder? Do you know? Yeah, I think I think so. There might even be footage of it in the, in the, one of the daily recent daily videos. Um, I haven't been able to watch them because my my signal has been my my bandwidth is just so low. But yeah, I was I think I was scrubbing through one and I saw Nick had put in the shots that Mary got of uh, it's like a little yellow, um, almost like a, like a gondola. Like yeah, it's like a bucket. And then I, I don't know if that's what they use to get up there or not, but. It's either that or one of those boom lifts, or there's also scaffolding on on the on the Stargate side of right. the structure. They're, they're scaffolding up, at least partially up up the structure. So there's multiple ways for them to get up there. I don't know. All I know is I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't want to be the one doing that. I mean, I, I'm not really too afraid of heights or anything, but just like I imagine with the wind and the structure not being fully complete yet, like you get up there, you're gonna feel that thing moving around. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, it's, I've 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 watched the videos, you know, and I've I can't remember I've seen them in the bucket before, but I thought they were just sort of inspecting stuff. But uh, so a lot of people in chat who watch the videos, they're either saying parachute in, anti gravity belts, jetpacks. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure any of those are accurate, but bucket on Bluezilla, I think that one might be an accurate assessment. There's look, I'm, I'm there's not, the again, scaffolding not... with the ladder. Yep. The yeah, stairs. I'm not positive with the with with the bucket. Like you said, it might just be inspection of Bluezilla itself. I know yeah. for sure I've 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 edited footage of the of the bucket um, while they were getting Bluezilla back up and running after the, one of those recent hurricanes. But yeah, yeah I don't know. It, it's it's crazy. I would parachute into it. That'd be fun. Like you know, it's like a stadium, <laughs> like one of those uh, when they parachute into, into a football stadium. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. Soccer stadium. <laughs> soccer stadium. Soccer stadium. Uh, yeah. that was... <laughs> I mean, there's a lift on here. There's a stair, sort of a staircase thing that goes up the middle of that scaffolding. I, yeah. I can't imagine. Imagine climbing all those stairs to get up to the, you know, sixth level, eighth level, whatever it is. That's crazy. I, um, honestly, I'm, I have a, a tough enough time out here in the heat and the humidity and whatnot. Just in my shorts and my desert hat, and my desert gear. Like, I honestly do not understand and i yep. do not know how the workers out here do what they do uh given that they have to wear you know most of them are wearing long sleeves long long pants and they're wearing facial coverings and they're wearing a, a welding mask and they're you know probably wearing steel-toed boots which aren't exactly uh easily ventilatable you know <laughs> so these guys the people out here they're they're seriously muscling and, and working to get this stuff put together and, and props to them because it is no joke out here. Look now, now we got the bucket in the. Oh video my gosh! Here. There's like, the bucket. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Can you imagine? You would write it. You no, would write no, that? I I, yeah, I would look, hard pass on that. I think. I, okay, think of all the carnival rides you've ridden in your life that you totally shouldn't have. I, is... bet you that, I, I bet you that bucket is like ten times safer than any carnival ride. Valid. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding y'all i there's so many questions coming in and we're i'm having a ton of fun with this show by the way this is like <laughs> one of the cooler formats where we just sort of hang out and talk about cool stuff chat i don't know what y'all think sorry we're not like hardcore on the news but i'm sort of in charge of the show today and i'm just like i don't know this is cool to talk about <laughs> um but let's get some more questions and uh yeah. and, and re-answer some other things 
Uh, Jack, here's one for you. What do you think? What's up with Hoppy's new red lights? This is Brian Silver asking. What do you think oh, those man. red lights See, are? That's like, that's one of those ones where I, I really should know the answer to this, and I don't know what the real answer is. Didn't we look it up at one point, and it was a it was a sea turtle abatement thing, mm -hmm. like a it's there the red light is more friendly to to sea turtles nesting, and there are um. I mean, this whole Boca Chica Beach is a sea turtle nesting area. I'm trying to right. remember the name of the specific turtle. Uh, when you turn uh, on, like, the in... Go for it. I, I don't know if it's Loggerhead or Ridley's Sea Turtle. It's one of those two. Oh, I think, it's, I think it's the Ridley's. Um, that sounds right to me, but I'm not positive. But, when, like, when you're driving out on Highway 4, out to the build and launch site, there's multiple signs that are like, turn on AM 1610 for battlefield information, because there's also a Civil War battlefield right around here. And in that, in that like blurb that the radio says when you when you tune to that station, they mention that there's the, you know, I, I'm afraid if it's Ridley's or not, but it's a sea turtle that nests here that's one of the most, if not the most, endangered. So it's it's critical sea turtle habitat. So that yeah. those red lights on Hopper, I think, if I'm not mistaken, are is, did I hedge enough? Are, I think so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think know. those lights are, are for sea turtles. Next, somebody's going to tell us it's like an anti-turtle water tower, and we'll just have to roll with it. Like, I <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyways, <laughs> I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and speed run some more questions here. So many questions in the queue, y'all, and we're like, oh, it's going to be a Q and A episode, and then we're just talking Babbling about babbling on stuff. about one question. Yeah, we do that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's a good one. Deadpin asked, why test Starship so close to the rest of the facilities? If Starship drifts over the facilities during a hop, would the RSO blow it? So it's really not that close. It's like a mile and a half away from the other facilities. Yeah, things are relatively spaced out. The The reason it seems like everything's close is because there's nothing in between anything. Because right. they're in the middle of nowhere. Um, but yeah, there's a few miles separation from like the production site and the launch site. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, I mean the the worst the worst that would happen is they would, you know, damage some part of the launch site. Probably the worst part of the launch site to damage would be the tank farm. But I don't even think we don't know. But I don't think these things have range safety um, charges. Well, no, on they definitely they definitely do. They do. Okay. Oh yeah, they, absolutely. Like, get out of control. You think? Yeah, there's definitely a, a flight way to terminate the flight. Um, I I, mean, I can I can speak specifically to what specific system they're using right they 100 percent. i mean the faa would not approve hop tests if there wasn't a flight termination system of some kind that i wonder sense. if they just blow the raptor like <laughs> it could literally be something like that i mean I'm all you have to do it, all you have to do is spark the fuel and it will terminate itself it's not a super complicated yeah. process yeah but, yeah all uh, i mean is yeah. i don't think there's like a shape charge going up and down this thing but i don't know that I don't think yeah. it would unzip it if it was me, and I don't know what the FAA approves or not, but I would probably just, you know, this thing is up and it starts to get out of control. If you blow that Raptor, it's just coming straight down. You know, right. you're, you're not letting it get a lot of horizontal velocity, yeah. so you don't have to worry about it sort of ballistically falling towards Boca Chica Village or anything like that. As soon as that thing started to go sideways, if you just cut the Raptor, or if you don't have the ability to turn off the Raptor and you just literally beep, blow the Raptor, that thing is going to fall straight out of the sky straight down. Yep. So yep. That, it could be as simple as that. Again, I don't. we don't know that for sure. I'd be super curious to see if Elon would answer that, because you all know he answers tweets sometimes, but... Uh, I imagine the other thing I was going to point out when it does the hop, the landing pad is away from the launch pad. And what I mean by yeah. that is I'll see if I can bring it up really quickly. Um, let me just bring up a map of Boca Chica maps. The first, the first thing Starship does when it launches is move away from the yep. stuff you wouldn't want it to hurt. Right. Yep. That is exactly right. I'll grab a map real quick. Um, yeah. And here's Boca Chica. Here's the launch pad. Give me satellite. All right. So right here, this is. Do we Gosh, have it? They need to there? update these satellite images so they really badly. Do. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. There we go. So so this is Boca Chica Village. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Too small. Here, let's Goldilocks this. That one's just right. All right. Um. So this is Boca Chica Village. This is the production site over at the edge. This is the test site here, right? And when they launch, the launch mount is over here, and when it hops, it starts to go this way, 
it starts off its motion going away from everything. It starts off its motion going out to sea, basically. And when it hops, it sort of goes like this, and it, it lands over in this area. So it's not like it's ever moving towards civilization. It's never really moving towards right. the production site, moving towards Boca Chica Village. Its entire motion is it goes up, and it starts to go away. And if they needed to, and they just cut that raptor, it would fall straight down out of the sky on the ground there. Um, Can so you point out on this map where the roadblocks and where mary like films the test from because i don't think i actually yeah. know yeah absolutely so the hard roadblock is usually right here it's okay. the y at the end of the street in the test facilities over here remember that's where yep. we're looking at it this is about 1.5 miles right here 1.4 right. 1.5 uh sometimes when it's not a hop if it's a a filling test or something like that mary will be somewhere along this road and uh -huh. when it's a hop and people aren't allowed to be on the side of the road, she'll be back in the village a little bit on a okay. route, basically. So. Oh, yeah, I got you, got you. And, and that's why I know if you've seen the hop videos, I, it does go mostly away from us. But from the camera view, it also tends to go slightly to the right. Yep. And you can see from the angle there why the landing pad is slightly to the right from the camera view. I yep. got you. You'd have the tower, you'd have like SN6 right there, and then the landing pad is a little bit to the right of it. It sort of moves up and away into the right just to here, and the landing yeah. pad's over like this. So gotcha. that's exactly right. The hop literally looks like that right there. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like drawing on the screen. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's grab another question, shall we? I don't even know sure. how we're doing on time. Oh, look, it's the end of the video. Cool. We got, a little, we got time for a couple more questions. Well, I think sure. I need to click on this link real quick. Look at this fine. fine oh, fine, I fine see. We got to plug merch. <laughs> Jeez. Plug that. Has anybody even seen? Do you know how much work it took to figure out how to do all this? <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> please, please click the link. <laughs> it's actually you just you click a thing and it appears. Um, anyways, Texas Tank Watchers merch. Um, let's grab some more questions here. That's a really great question uh, on how do they test it so close. Here's a good one. If Starship can't lay on its side, how will it withstand the lateral loads of reentry? That's a really good question. Can't... Great question. Let's read it um, again. If Starship can't lay on its side, how will? Oh, I see what yeah. it's saying. Okay. If it's moving through the air sideways and it's, it's doing a belly, right. belly flop. Why won't it just fold in half if it's doing the belly flop? Um, I'm not sure what they're referencing when they say the starship can't lay on its there was side. A, there was an Elon tweet. Somebody asked him uh, if it could be laid on its side. I forget if it was for colonization purposes. That's what I... Or... Okay. All right. I think I get it. So, yeah. Lines, or maybe it was... It might have even been transport. Um, but I forget what the, what the context of why the, the, the person asking the question wanted it to be laid on its side. But Elon, I think, was just like, no. I think, yeah, I, I think I know what you're talking about now. I think someone asked them if they could, after landing on, say, the moon or Mars, if a starship could be laid horizontally to be used as, like, a habitat or something, and that he said no to that. But I think that was purely a matter of they don't plan on doing it. Starship will just sit vertical and can be used as a habitat that way. They're not going to put, you know, extra legs on the nose to, like, lower it horizontal or anything. It's, it's my understanding that Starship... Uh needs to be moved vertically and is not designed to be laid horizontally in the way that Falcon is. That is that is my understanding. I could be wrong, but I do not believe it is designed to be in a horizontal orientation. And if you look We're... at the payload user guide, the payload user guide even says everything is Vertical transported yeah. vertically, assembled on site vertically. And so, we've never so, seen stainless steel no. rings on their side, have we? No, so so uh, again, that's my understanding is that Starship is not built for that. Um, so I don't know what the difference between falling through the atmosphere. Maybe it's just strictly gravity. Like when you're falling through the atmosphere and you have aero forces on, on the vehicle versus when you are resting on the surface under gravity. You know, maybe maybe there's something different. Maybe it has to do with the vehicle being pressurized, I, or, or maybe it's like Thomas said, they just don't have planes to do it. Um, but yeah, that's that's yeah. a very very good question. I bet you. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't want to get into like the in depth engineering of it, but the f loads that the vehicle would face while just sitting horizontally on the ground versus in an airflow where the load is distributed along the entire vehicle. Uh, those are two very different things. Um, so cool. I, I yeah, I would I wouldn't um. Well, I wouldn't say I mean, that because a... they don't want to put it horizontal here on Earth and on the ground. I wouldn't say that precludes it will have some sort of issue dealing with reentry forces. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, uh, I will say, I bet you somebody's done the math on it. I don't think they would build it, be yeah, building I'm, yeah. it if somebody didn't run the math, right? Yeah, I, I think they have confirmed that the starship they're building can withstand re-entry. That's a pretty important part yeah, of the design. So. Sort of an important thing. Um, and one of the things that they'll be testing when they get into the higher hops, when they get into the belly flops and stuff like that, I'm not going to tell you that we won't see a starship fall out of the sky or fold in half. I oh mean, sure it's a test campaign that's what they're doing yep. to test these things yep. so yeah and the lesson from that would be put more struts there <laughs> <laughs> add more struts <laughs> add more struts let's grab some more questions here hey uh for Inc, thank you so much ferenc for Inc. ferenc you already taught me that one jack it says go store thank you for the super chat saying <laughs> go store and then uh jordan jk Komen says Pressurized 304L, pressurized 304L stainless steel tanks are strong. I certainly am sure they're strong, um, and I'm certainly sure somebody's run the numbers on it there, Jordan. So thank you so much for the super chat as well. Let's grab some more questions here. Uh, let me see. What about, gosh, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place. There are other things involved. Do, 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 do. Let's hop back to the other thing. We'll keep the Starship videos rolling, but let's answer some questions about the cape. And yeah, sure. Thomas, you may be able to get this one for us. Uh, Quartzy asked, how does it come that the range can handle two launches the same day? I thought there was talking that the range can't do that. Is that, let's see here. Is that these are in different directions or both by SpaceX? Like, why do we think the space, the, the range can handle two launches in one day? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, so there's there's a couple of different theories. We don't have an official answer, and we're definitely going to work on that and try and get you know as much information as we can because this is a super unprecedented thing, at least recently, as far as two launches that are within about nine hours of one another. Um, here's what we know. What we do know is that previously, uh, the Eastern Range had said that it needs about 17 hours between two launches to turn around all the range assets. There's tracking assets, there's support teams from the Space Force that are supporting all of these launches, and to go from one launch game pain to the other, they need about 17 hours. Um, but that has evidently changed because these two launches are about nine hours. And what we think the biggest difference is, is their flight termination systems, which is a range safety asset that is used, that is provided by the Space Force. Um, all, or at least the telemetry link that those systems use is a Space Force asset. Um, what we believe is the difference here, and we were looking at the difference between launching a Delta IV Heavy and a Falcon 9 within close proximity to one another, and two Falcon 9s. The Falcon 9 rockets, and in fact all Falcon family rockets, the heavies as well, use a system called the Automated Flight Termination System, AFTS. It is completely autonomous. It will detect if the launch is uh, going off course or off nominal for any reason that requires a termination of the flight. Um, the Delta IV Heavy, an older rocket that is nearing its retirement, um, does not have an automated flight termination system. It relies on ground controllers manually triggering the flight termination should that ever be necessary. And that, I think, is the biggest difference. The AFTS system that Falcons use allow them to turn around the range much faster than turning around between a manual flight termination and an automated one. So we believe, and that's not confirmed, but that is our working theory, on how the range can support two Falcon 9s within nine hours of one another. Gotcha. So it comes down to SpaceX is the only provider that has that automated flight term or, or something like that. Is that true? They are the only one at the keep that has the automated flight termination system. Um, gotcha. Atlas V, Delta, and even Vulcan, uh, none of those will have automated termination systems. Um, the SLS will not have an automated flight termination system. Uh, we have not heard from Blue Origin about what they're termination system for New Glenn will be yet. Um, I think it is. Uh, most systems are trying to move that way. Um, recently, Rocket Lab and their Electron rocket um, recently debuted their automated flight termination system, so they have one now. Um, I believe Antares, North of Grumman's uh, Cygnus launch vehicle, um, that uh, Antares does not have an automated flight termination system either. Um, so right now, uh, the SpaceX Falcons and the Rocket Lab Electron are actually the only ones I can think of that definitely do have it. Vulcan will likely have it some years down the road. We know they're not going to have it initially um, because they're using the same avionics package that Atlas and Delta use, which is not an automated flight termination system. Um, but uh, so the only ones at the Cape are the Falcon family right now. Gotcha. 
All right. And I was just, <laughs> Thomas, I don't know if you saw me, but I was sitting there shaking my head at those guys that were up. I, I, you know, I was watching and I was like nervously asking, what the heck am I looking at? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was trying not to like lose my train of thought with that video clip. Sorry, I wasn't trying to distract you, but I saw those posts <laughs> and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's grab some more questions here as well. Sure. Uh, Curiosity Show, thank you for the super chat here real quick. Change your name to this. You have the random tube. Oh, you started your own channel. Okay, cool. Thanks, <laughs> I, say thanks to Mary for making your morning tea great. Good deal. Thank you so much for uh, the support there. And then Moldy Space Industry is hopping in as well with the $5 Moldy. You are no no uh, stranger to this. We appreciate you. You said, whoops, I'm late. Here's to keeping Thomas and the gang alive tomorrow. <laughs> we greatly appreciate that. Tomorrow's going to be a busy day at Cape Canaveral. I'm pretty much planning to spend the entire day down there tomorrow. So... Stay tuned for lots of live coverage of all the different events going on. Yeah, no kidding. And we should mention, because I don't think we've touched on it, so we mentioned the two Falcon 9 launches and the Starship yep. Hop, all of which yep. is scheduled no earlier than tomorrow. Yep. There is also Rocket Lab Electron's return to flight mission just after the SALCOM 1B mission. Obviously, that's from New Zealand, not a Cape Canaveral thing. Uh, but there's that, so there's actually like four launches, three of which are orbital uh, tomorrow, as for, at least tomorrow Eastern time. Different time zones, it's not quite Sunday. Um, oh, we're going to plug Michael's website here, what? Next Space no. Flight. I just I just searched for best rocket launch schedule website. Yes. This is what came up. What Absolutely. am I supposed to do? <laughs> yeah, so so this will see you'll see several things coming up here. Uh there you go. The two Falcon 9 launches, the Starship 150 meter hop test and Rocket Lab's return to flight mission all happening tomorrow Eastern time. Uh Rocket Lab goes into the 31st uh, UTC time. Um, and then that other one that we mentioned, the Arian Space Vega return to flight mission the day after that. Delta IV Heavy, hopefully ready to launch soon. I mean, gosh, it's been busy. And I keep seeing, <laughs> I, if you follow us on Twitter, I've been tweeting, because when, when it first came out, there were like five or six launches all happening in quick succession. So I made a tweet with the entire launch schedule to like keep myself straight more than anything else. None of those have launched yet. <laughs> this was supposed to happen a couple days ago. It's still supposed to start, and it still hasn't happened yet. But they still got this huge chunk of missions ready to go, so it's exciting. Gotcha. Hey, why don't we just start using this as our launch schedule graphic? Like, Honestly, we need we should. <laughs> yeah, y'all. I'm a. Uh... <laughs> Here's the page that I'm going to. I'll put it into chat real quick. Uh, Michael, I don't mean to crash your web server or anything like that, but uh, there you go. <laughs> Nextspaceflight.com slash launches is what I was displaying on the screen there. So anyways, um, it is 429. We started the show at three o'clock, so that's an hour and a half. I don't uh, know what our plan is, but I know we never get through all of the different super chats or all of we we don't always get through all the questions. Uh, Brendan Gleason, big day tomorrow. Great show as always. Brendan, thank you so much. For the five euros, we appreciate you there. Um, I don't know. Do we want to try and speed run a couple questions? How y'all doing on time, Jack? I know you're out and about. I know you probably have to go. What's uh, what's our status here? I'm hanging out. I'm just keeping myself muted because I stepped outside and there's a bunch of heavy machinery going on. Because you know they're building starships. Because they're building starships. No big deal. I, I'm down. I'm hanging out. If you want to answer, ask me some more questions, I'll just uh, mute and unmute myself periodically here. Yeah, Thomas, how are uh, you doing, dude? I know you've been yeah. out at the Cape a lot. Yeah, I know, and I, I do have to now finish that Salcom 1B launch article at some point, but uh, right. I've, I've got a little bit. I know we started about five minutes late, and uh, to be fair, though, if Delta can hold for an hour this morning, we can hold for five minutes, okay? <laughs> but uh, yeah, we can, we can speed run a couple of things with to wrap things up, sure. All right, let's keep getting some more questions here. Uh, Twisted Citrus, thank you so for, so much for the membership there. We appreciate you. Uh, let's, let's grab some good ones here. Here's one. This is over to the Cape as well. What about the landing? So does this go straight or dog leg as well? Referring back to South. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, Thomas, take okay. that one there. Yeah, sure. So if you want to bring up the trajectory again, perfect. Got it. Um, I, you're already on it. So like a the rat on a dog cheeto. <laughs> dog leg maneuver is uh, performed by the second stage of Falcon 9, not the first stage. So the first stage flies in a pretty straight path um, on its initial uh, azimuth. Um, and uh, after stage separation, the second stage will, a little bit later on, perform that dogleg maneuver to uh, prevent overflying Florida. Yeah. Um, so the first stage doesn't have to do any weird dogleg maneuvers or anything for its boost back burn or anything. It's a pretty normal flight profile. Um, as far as the first stage is concerned, it's just flying south and back versus east and back. Um, the, yeah. And the landing will, so that will be pretty straightforward. It's the second stage that does the weird dogleg thing. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll bring this up just really quickly here. So you see this little gap. This is actually where they do the stage step. Then second yep. stage cuts back in. First stage does the boost back burn. That's the stage step right there between booster and, and second stage. And if you look at it in three dimensions, this is such a cool site. Declan's site is so cool. If you look at it like this, you can see that booster is mostly just going straight. And then it's turning back around. It's not doing the dog leg. The dog leg doesn't happen until down here. As I zoom out a little bit, you can see it's the yeah, second stage. It really starts to bend that trajectory there. So great answer. Let's move on to the next question, see if we can get a couple of these in. Um, again, this site right here, this is flightclub.io. Here's a link in chat for y'all. Right there. Yeah, Flight Club rules. Use it, it to plan your rocket launch photography. It's really, really good for planning streak shots. Yep. Shout out to Flight and Declan. Um, let's see here. Do we think there's still going to be any Vandenberg launches, Jack? Jack <laughs> hopes there's going to be Vandenberg launches. Yeah, someone is someone specifically trolling me. Who asked that? <laughs> Who asked? Uh, <laughs> I typed it in. I'm just not going to tell him. Um, but yeah, uh, there's definitely going to be more Vandenberg launches. There, we were in this horrible, horrible lull where I think ULA had a stand down for like something like I don't know, like 18 months or just an insane amount of time where there was no launches from Vandenberg from ULA between the their last Delta Heavy um, from Slick Six and uh, and now. And I think the next ULA launch from Vandy is going to be, oh man, I don't even know when it is, but it's next year, I think. It might, it might be end of this year, early next year, something like that. But hopefully the drought will end soon. And, uh, and I don't think the Polar Corridor is going to kill Vandy launches. Um, and, and I think SpaceX will continue to launch from Vandenberg as well. Hopefully the Polar Corridor is like you were saying, Thomas, more about um, deconfliction and you know it just enables us to launch more from all places so i'm i'm optimistic that vandenberg has a long and illustrious life ahead of it specifically spacex's pad there although there are plenty there's constantly rumors you know gloom and doom oh vandenberg's dead vandenberg's gone just vandenberg's just different and that's part of the reason why we like it is because vandenberg's different yeah, I've got the uh, answer here for you. Then, so after Enroll 44 here from Cape Canaveral, the next Delta IV Heavy is ULA's next launch from Vandenberg, and that is no earlier than like the later this year. Um, yeah, so okay, that's that still makes slated. sense. Uh, and there's also a Falcon 9 launch, the uh, Sentinel 6A mission uh, fr is from Vandenberg as well, so that's coming up. I was, I was trying yeah, to see so. if a uh, next space flight would allow me to filter by location. I am not trained on this. I couldn't figure out <laughs> how to do it. Michael, I, I know that the app is different as well, so I could probably do it on my phone and like hold it up to the camera or something, <laughs> but I couldn't see it on the website. Uh, Michael can tell us whether that's a thing. In back channel, we're saying Sentinel 6A there, it looks like. Yeah. So, yeah, I believe anyway. that's before the Delta IV Heavy mission, yeah. Yeah. Speedrun, speedrun. Um, Astro6, thank you for the super chat. If all the launches happen as planned tomorrow, will this be the most launches to happen so close together? Are we going to break some sort of record if SpaceX launches two? From I the same would facility? have to do a deep dive into some historical stats to figure it out. Um, it is certainly up there. I mean, especially worldwide statistics when you add the Rocket Lab launch in. Yep. Um. Yeah, that that might be close to to some records. I know. I mean, there's been a couple of times where there's been two or three launches all happening, you know, within very close proximity to one another. Um, it might be a Cape specific record too, just nine hours between the two, at least un to, unless you go all the way back to like the Gemini program and things like that. But yeah, um, it's up know, there. Know, right? like, we'd have to do, do. We'd have to check. I know, like in the '80s, Russia was launching things like crazy, and yeah. uh, they had facilities. And I know they did a couple launches in less than 24 hours. Uh, mm -hmm. I was looking at Jonathan McDowell's website, right, that had all the rocket yep. launch, the big text file, and I wrote something to sort of parse that and look through, but I, I, I didn't see anything that was nine hours apart. So either way you slice it, whether it's a record or not, we need to do that on a regular basis if we're going to be moving into space, if you ask me. I it's mean, like, what do I know? It's like, it's like we're approaching Salvo territory. <laughs> it's just like, fire yeah. all missiles! Yep. <laughs> um, let me see here. I can grab this one really quickly. I think... I can grab, yeah, I can grab this one really quickly. Uh, Eugene, Eugene asked, "Hey, you, why did Delta Four Heavy get burned? So why did Delta Four Heavy get burned? Uh, that is a normal thing for Delta Four Heavy. Let me see if I can grab that link for you real quick and bring it up on the screen. But uh, Thomas, talk about that real quick while I grab the video. Yeah. So Delta IV Heavy is a liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled rocket. 
Um, and uh, when it starts its RS-68 main engines, uh, there is a huge amount of hydrogen at the base of the rocket um, as the engine starts up and there's hydrogen in the atmosphere and from the engine starting. Um, and all of that when the engine starts ignites at the base of the rocket. Um, so that is basically just excess hydrogen burning when the engine ignites. Um, it is perfectly normal. It is planned for. ULA designed the rocket to withstand the fireball at the base of the rocket because yep. they knew that they, this was going to happen. Um, if for some reason they couldn't make the rocket withstand the fireball at the base of the rocket, there are ways to design hydrogen engines that don't do this. The space shuttle had hydrogen main engines and didn't have this phenomenon happen. Um, but ULA said, no, we'll just design the rocket to withstand uh, those forces and those heating. Um, yeah. So that it's perfectly normal part of the rocket, uh, of the Delta IV family. Yeah, specifically the, the R68A engines, they pre-cool them by running liquid hydrogen through them. Yeah. And that liquid hydrogen comes out, it hits ambient temperature and pressure. It goes from being a liquid to being a gas. Hydrogen, as you know, if you've ever seen the blimps and stuff like that, hydrogen balloons will, will go up because it's lighter than the normal atmosphere, and you get this rising cloud of hydrogen. The Rofis then ignite the bottom of it, and that whole cloud just burns off. But again, like Thomas said, they uh, designed the rocket for that. That's a normal thing. I call it the flame festival when a Delta IV heavy launches. Because it <laughs> imagine intentionally... If, yeah. Imagine if a Methalox rocket had a similar engine startup thing, oh, a giant blue flame around the vehicle. How <laughs> cool would that be? That would be pretty cool. That would somebody, be somebody cool. call up uh, Tori Bruno and have him do that for Vulcan. For Vulcan. Could you real yeah. quick just pre-chill the engines with some? Uh, <laughs> hey, Twisted Cit <laughs> Twisted Citrus, thank you so much. Another super chat, ten dollars. This is for y'all. Stay, y'all stay safe. Go SpaceX. Thank you, Twisted Citrus. Your name is a little bit hard to say, but I'll I'll say it. Um, I'm gonna see if <laughs> I can grab citrus, one more twisted question. Twisted Citrus. Twisted Twist Citrus. Twisted. Citrus. <laughs> it's like Twisted Sister, but that's a band. Um, <laughs> Let's see here. I'm trying to see if I can find anything else. Is Hopper really used as a water tank? It is, isn't it, Jack? I mean, I don't think we have official word on that, and I want to be very clear on what we do know is a water tank and what we don't know is a water tank. And I am not clear if Star Hopper is or not. What I will say is that there are several black water tanks next to Star Hopper. I have seen personally two water trucks deliver water to the vicinity of Star Hopper. Right. Star Hopper itself has two blue hoses connected to it and to the same pump machinery that those black water tanks are connected to. So whether it's a filter, whether it's a water tank, whether it's just a pipe, a big pipe or tube or something, you know, I don't know what they're using it for, but it sure as heck looks like a water tower to me. Yeah, whatever, but, whatever but I don't it know. is. Yeah, uh, we, we have it on, on good, we have some good indication that backs up that idea, right? Um, yeah, we're pretty good at determining what's a water tower and what's not a water tower. Uh, so anyways, <laughs> let us I think that's all the questions. I mean, there's still more questions in there, but they're all more detailed questions. And well, we're I'll up... tell you what, if you Go have ahead. questions that we have not answered tonight, please send them to us on social media. If Michael will bring up the overlay with our Twitter handles down below. Um, if for any reason uh, we did not get to your question tonight, please send them to our Twitter handle. We will absolutely try to answer them there. I know we can't get to all of them uh, live on the show, but we'll try to answer any we can. Good deal. Um, and I, I switched it over. It went to the tracking camera, and I was really con fused all of a sudden because it was like our camera in our scene with another one. <laughs> that's what just happened we'll just go to this scene now um but that is we're 10 minutes over our time normally nasa space flight live on saturdays goes for an hour and a half and we've now been going for well an hour and a half because we start a little bit late but i think it is time for us to shut it down this guy over here needs to get a little bit of rest so that he can be prepared for the cape extravaganza tomorrow of course this is thomas berghart one of the editors and uh, editors one of the writers and live stream hosts for NASA space flight. Editors, Thomas. writers, and live stream hosts. I, I find myself yeah. doing more and more these Dude, days. It says right up there. It says editor. I mean, we. I know. We I got a promotion. Lots of hats. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today here on NASA Space Flight Live, providing some insight and commentary. We really do appreciate you, man. Uh, always, a, always a pleasure to be here on NSF Live. Thanks, Doss. You know what you need to do? I'm going to say this really quickly. You need to go to uh, nasaspaceflight.com slash shop, and you need to buy some rocket posters or something to put on the wall behind you. Man, it's funny you should say that, Das. I don't know. Maybe you have to come back next week when I have uh, my white walls more, you know, interesting things behind me. Maybe you'll see something cool. I don't know. I think there's some nice sunrise pictures that you could put behind you or Ooh, something. Ooh, there's that. an idea. I don't know. Jeez, let's just <laughs> toss that out there. Shameless hint, hint, form. wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> and also y'all give it up for jack buyer over here jack that is the freshest 
of bespoke artisanal selfies that you can get. <laughs> he sent that to me right before the start of the show. He is down there at Boca Chica. He is going to be helping with the NSF coverage. Of course, absolutely, we will have the expert on the scene. Mary should be out there getting us a live stream. And then Jack's going to be out there, too, uh, taking some video, getting some footage. So uh, we are going to be covering the hop. Jack, thank you so much for dialing in today and uh, hanging out with us here. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and be excellent to each other. Remember, wear your sunscreen, stay hydrated, look out for mosquitoes. Um, Don't tell but... me what to do, Dad. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez, Dad. <laughs> but uh, y'all, Jack Byer, you can see his information up there in the corner, at the Jack Byer on Twitter. And uh, Jack, thank you so much for uh, sending me that fashionable-looking ninja selfie and <laughs> dialing into the show today. We appreciate you. Yeah, you got it. I got to represent my Rockwell International shirt. Also, in the background today, we had Michael Baylor. Uh, Michael Baylor working on some of the links, doing some production behind the scenes, overlays and stuff like that. Uh, there's Michael up there. Next Space Flight also made that Next Space Flight app that we were talking about that I brought up on the screen. So, Michael, I don't know if you're on audio or not, but uh, thank you so much for supporting the streams, making these things happen. No problem. He was there the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> the call is coming from inside the stream. Hey, we. <laughs> We also showed an awful lot of video from Boca Chica Gal, an indispensable member of the NASA space flight team down there at Boca Chica, bringing those daily videos. I mean, she is, she's got to be north of hundreds of hours of video now. And they're yeah. always such fantastic views of what's hanging on. I guarantee you the defense is not going to stop her heat, nor <laughs> rain, nor sleet, nor hurricanes coming in. Nothing nope. stops Barry and Mary out there. Uh, Boca Chica gal. So as always, I want everybody in the chat, an integral member of our team, give it up for Boca Chica gal. And we'll be seeing some more of her tomorrow. I hope I get her on comms and talk about the hop a little bit as we wait for SN6 to hop. Did I miss anything else? I think we're good. Uh, well, we should probably thank uh, Daz, who was doing the, all the hosting tonight. Uh, John Galloway, Kerbal Space Academy. He's always pushing all the buttons, pulling all the levers behind these streams and hosting us, uh, relaying us, and making sure we don't say anything too ridiculous on stream. Look, looking uh, confused thinking... a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Hughes, thank the Daz for everything he does for our lives. I do love streams. the the imagery of pushing all the buttons and pulling all the levers. Cause every time we say that, I just picture Doss in a giant like boiler room, like steampunk. It's like shoveling coal and pulling large brass handles. We, I really can't uh, echo Thomas's words enough. Thank you, Doss, for everything I need, you do. I need a shovel that I can shovel bend with into modem. <laughs> It is. Y'all, uh, if you watch my Twitch stream, if you know me from Twitch, you may know me as DOS. I'm actually John Galloway with NASA Spaceflight here uh, doing some live stream stuff. But this is a blast. I, I cannot say how much fun today's show was. And it's a fantastic uh, it's a fantastic thing to be part of the team here. I've tried to do this by myself, and I cannot do it by myself. Missing camera feeds, missing information, missing all these photos and pictures. Being a part of the NASA Spaceflight team is, is a fantastic thing. So everybody out there, remember, y'all are part of the team as well we appreciate you showing up i think we got somewhere north of three like 2500 3000 people watching the show today it's amazing to us that uh, you would show up and watch a couple space nerds show videos <laughs> on the screen while we talk for an hour and a half about random rocket stuff that we're really excited about but uh, that is going to be the end for nasa space flight today you know you can keep up with us follow the youtube channel here there's a little thingy you can click on there's a bell that has some sort of ringing capabilities uh, if you want to be notified on the streams make sure that you set that to all notifications so that you get those notifications popping up on your mobile device or whatever whenever we do something also if you're a membership uh red team is red team or above uh join the discord because we're trying to post up when we go live in the discord did i say that wrong michael yeah what uh, level yeah. is it uh, capcom cat is it yeah. capcom or above okay thank you we really need a menu. I, I gotta. I keep forgetting that, but it's Capcom <laughs> or above that can hop into the Discord, and we try to post notifications there. Also, hey, follow us on Twitter at NASA Spaceflight. Actual is the guy in charge with the funny accent. Um, the good news is on Twitter, there's no accent. You just read what he says. And it's all good. <laughs> but uh, we are gonna go ahead and shut down the stream. For One today. more thing, Don. Oh, what? What did I miss? Members, oh. launch director and above. What? That's not on the schedule. Jeez. <laughs> what do you think this is? <laughs> 
thanks to all of our members who support us as well. The launch directors and above. You can see the launch directors there. Quite a few names. That font gets smaller and smaller because more and more people keep signing up. And then flight engineers, the, uh, the top level of support there. Thank you all so much for making these shows possible. Am I good now? Yes, you are. <laughs> thanks, Michael. Michael's, Michael's got our backs if I forget something because uh, I do forget things on occasion. But now... Team. Now, exactly, team. It's teamwork. It doesn't work unless we have the whole team in it together. So um, for now, we will go ahead and shut down today's episode of NASA Space Flight Live, and we appreciate all y'all showing up and hanging out with us. Later on, nerds, let's roll that uh, video that we still need to edit at some point. We'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. We'll get around to it. It's not like you have other things to do, Jack. <laughs> all right, later, nerds. Pressure looks good. Time right now. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these.